Linear motors are our next stop on our tour of electric motors. They can come in small ones, they can come in really big ones. And after watching this, tell me that California Screaming, now known as a credit coaster at Disneyland's California Adventure in Anaheim, isn't a linear motor, a really big, powerful linear motor. I geek out on things like this. I hope you do too after you watch this. If you need any help, reach out to us at the website and email address here. I'm Corey Foster of Valen Corporation. Let's see what we can learn. So first off, a linear motor is pretty much the same technology as a rotary motor, just opened up and unfurled like a sail. It generates a force, a linear force, as opposed to a rotary torque. And then we no longer call it a stator and a rotor. Some people call it a primary and secondary, others call it the magnets and forcer. Personally, I just prefer the magnets and forcer. Magnets is a little more clear as to what it actually is. If we start by looking at conventional linear mechanics, we look here, we've got the, the machine bed here, uh, a ball screw or a lead screw perhaps, and a motor, an encoder, uh, a slide or a carriage, and then maybe a linear encoder here along the side of it. Each one of these points creates a point of elasticity or some compliance where there can be a little springiness to it. If we compare that to a linear direct drive where we might have magnets here, some copper coil here, a slide, and still a linear encoder, the only compliance here is between the linear encoder and the carriage or the slide. So you really get some better performance when you have that direct drive of a linear motor that'll speak to why we want to have a linear motor in our applications at times. So if we take a closer look at a typical screw-based table, here are the linear guides holding and carrying the load, and then a drive screw, again it could be a ball or a lead screw, and then the motor couples to that through the motor mount, and the motor may or may not have an encoder on the back of it, and then the carriage sits on top of the linear bearings, and that supports the load. If we look at the linear motor base table here, we still have a carriage or table. We still have the linear bearings here, but now instead of the ball screw or the lead screw, we have a linear motor. And then we have to have pretty much a linear encoder along the side, unless it is a linear stepper, and those do exist. We're not gonna be talking about linear steppers much today. We're really just talking about linear servos. Linear steppers do exist and have for a long, long time. They just aren't very common. They're not very popular. Uh, but there are even ones that go both in the X, Y directions. And so that's pretty cool. Uh, but the three types that we're gonna talk about today of linear servo motors are iron core, ironless, and slotless. Uh, these aren't all the types and there's variations on them, but they give you a good idea of the different pros and cons and different possibilities of the designs. So let's go into these more detail. Here's the iron core design where the forcer is up here, uh, or the carriage here with the, the forcer and the coils. These are the, mag the um, copper coils as part of the carriage. And then it has a single row of the magnets along the bottom. And then there's an iron back plate down here that really helps increase the magnetism. Then there's the ironless design where you have two rows of magnets along the side forming a U. And then the forcer goes up and down the middle like an I or a T. It's non-ferrous. There, there's no magnetism in the forcer going up and down. It's all just the copper coils that are uh, allowing the control along the magnet track. And you can see the pros and cons here of, you know, there's really no attractive forces uh, when the coils are off and there's no cogging. The heat management's a little bit of an issue uh, because you actually are putting the heat in the copper windings in the middle of that U. So where does the heat have to go? So the different designs, uh, different manufacturers will have different ways of dealing with that heat management. And then there's a slotless design, which is shaped a lot like the iron core design. So you still have this single row of magnets down here, and you still have a, a forcer going on top of it. Um, there's a couple of differences though. One is that there's no iron uh, backplate to the magnets, so you don't get that huge magnetic attraction. Also in this case, rather than the windings being just kind of these yeah, individual windings next to each other, uh, this happens to be the very same basket winding that I referred to in the uh, in the rotary servo motors just last episode, where it, rather than being turned into 
a basket around uh, the stator in the rotary motor, it's just laid out flat. Again, just used a rolling pin to lay it out flat. And these windings actually overlap a lot more than a typical winding. And so you get a very low cogging, pretty much a no cogging action there as the motor moves over it. Uh, this does show a laminated back iron, but it's it's not nearly the same as a uh, the, the heavy back iron of an iron core assembly. And then you have the epoxy that holds the windings into place, just like the other uh, linear motors. Here is a, a summary of these three different types and the good, better, or best. Uh, you see here that the slot list is really better across all of them. Uh, there are places where there are best, is you know, the cost is the uh, is the best on the iron core, um, but the velocity ripple is the best on the ironless, and the slot list is somewhere in between. So the slot list is a good average design in between all the uh, all the betters or all the, all the bests and goods. Uh, you can see some general ranges here. The iron core are really good for heavy duty applications where a lot of ton of force is needed. Uh, the ironless are going to be better where you need that high precision and higher acceleration rates and then the slot list is in between. So you might be wondering when you're going to use linear motors. Uh, high speeds, 3 to 5 meters per second, and the speed is really limited by the servo loop of the electronics and the linear bearings that is holding the load. The high precision is really important for linear motors. Uh, it's going to be controlled by your feedback device, so your resolution really is dependent upon that feedback device. You're not going to get the repeatability or the accuracy necessarily of that feedback device because you're limited by mechanics and servo tuning and, um, and, and just me uh, mechanical stiction and magnetic stiction. But uh, usually you can get really close to whatever that resolution of that linear encoder is. And then just overall, just great performance. You get a fast response, zero backlash, you get the stiffness of the system, low maintenance because you don't have the ball screw in there, you get smooth motion, uh, low velocity ripple, and just a much quieter environment because a ball screw can be pretty darn noisy and lead screws are even noisier usually. Uh, a few gotchas to be aware of. Uh, usually the cost is an issue. Linear motors are usually most uh, more expensive. However, I have been in applications where I'm working and sizing a ball screw and we want a little more precision out of it. So we put a, le uh, a linear encoder along the ball screw. And by that time we do that, it's actually more expensive than a linear motor oftentimes. So if you're really trying to squeeze more precision out of a ball screw, you might be better off just jumping to that linear motor. Um, the force per package size. Uh, the linear motors just don't get that force per package size that a ball screw does just because it doesn't have a mechanical advantage of that ball screw. Um, heating can be an issue. Magnetism can be an issue. No friction can be an interesting issue because if you're trying to do a vertical axis, a z-axis, uh, and if you turn off the power, that, lead, that linear motor coil it's just going to drop like a rock unless you put uh, you can put a shaft brake on there. You can put a counterbalance, either pneumatic or magnetic or mechanical counterbalance to hold it up. Or maybe you just don't care and you just put something on the bottom to just kind of catch it like a spring. Um, interesting story. I was once trying to tune a uh, XY linear motor stage where it had an X stage and a T. Uh, the uh, the Y was hanging off of it like a T, and on the end of the T were some air bearing chucks, and this was on a big granite stage. And I, I as when that load was out at the end of the T over those air bearing chucks, I could not tune this; it could not settle just because there was no friction to the system either on those bearings or in the linear motors themselves. Uh, until I finally figured out that if they turn down the pressure on those air bearings from 80 psi down to 40 psi to induce just a little bit of friction in it, then we can tune it the same way every time. Uh, but sometimes you have to induce friction into a system with linear motors in order to get the tuning performance that you want because without that the only friction in there is really the bearings themselves. So I hope this helps. I'm Corey Foster of Valen Corporation. If you have any questions just reach out to us here and we're happy to help.